Beyond Reason Radio. Well, you might be surprised to hear my voice on a Monday night. Because usually at 8 p.m. you don't hear my voice. You don't hear the music for Beyond Reason Radio. You do not hear this voice of reason. Usually Monday nights 8 to 10, you hear my friend, my buddy, Carl Jackson, who uh, does his show Mondays 8 to 10 usually. Well, he's actually making an appearance on Tucker tonight on Fox News. I believe it's tonight. And he had asked me, you know, he couldn't do a show tonight, and he had asked me if I could do my show as a fill-in. And I said, of course, of course, anytime. So we're doing two hours of Beyond Reason Radio. But don't worry, if you were if you were tuning in, expecting to hear him, he will be back next week. So I don't need your pitchforks and torches outside the studio wanting Carl Jackson to be on the air and upset that I'm on the air. He'll be back next week, but that's all right. So this is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. We are on till 10 p.m. tonight, like I said, here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. And we have a lot to get to on the show tonight. We have John McCain stuff. We had another mass shooting in Florida. Trump. Is he going to be impeached? Is he going to go to jail? This is what we keep hearing. And much, much more. But before we get to any of that, I have to once again talk to my producer, who's here again. Mr. Rob, how are you, Rob? Don't stop the show for me. I have to. That's beyond reason. I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> Always glad to be on Beyond Reason, Mike. Yeah, all right. So um, I want to start the show talking about John McCain. And there's some different angles I have to uh, things I heard over the weekend, some media coverage of John McCain's death. John McCain died, of course, on Saturday at age 81. He was battling a form of brain cancer. Uh, It was actually nine years to the day since Ted Kennedy died, and Ted Kennedy actually died of the same disease. And him and Ted Kennedy were actually kind of friends, but um, that was an interesting bit of fact that I did not know I heard today. Um, you know, Joe Biden's son, that's another big politician out there who also died of that same brain cancer. So it's a, it's a horrible, horrible disease. Um, but I watched the Sunday shows and of course they were all doing coverage of John McCain as they should. The guy was definitely a, a pivotal figure in American history. There's no doubt about that. And John McCain, of course, in my opinion, was a war hero is a war hero, anyone who was willing for one to put on the uniform and go to battle for the armed services is, you know, that that's more than I did in my life. So obviously you reserve, he deserves respect for that alone, but to be in a prisoner of war camp, one of the worst ever in Vietnam And having a chance to leave early because he was the son of a famous admiral said he was not going to, did not want the special treatment. He was in solitary confinement for two years out of that. He had a broken shoulder that never really healed right. When he got out, his hair was pretty much completely turned white. All of these things, you have to respect what he was able to overcome in his life and is a hero, in my opinion. There's no doubt about it. His politics, on the other hand, we have disagreements. Everyone wants to talk about the fact that John McCain was the maverick of the Senate. And usually what they mean by maverick is he was willing to cross the aisle and make deals with the Democrats. And some people hated this because they thought he was caving on Republican principles, and some people loved it because bipartisanship's the way. Usually it was Democrats who loved it because they were the ones who were getting the deals. But before we get into some of that, there was something I heard uh, on ABC this week yesterday. Jeff Flake, the other senator from Arizona, who was friends with John McCain, knew him really well, was asked about John McCain, what he learned from John McCain the most. 
I thought this was an interesting comment. I don't agree with Jeff Flake a lot. He's become, you know, he's very, very anti-Trump, but he's pretty moderate Republican. I think he's kind of a grandstander in a lot of cases. But he said something here that resonated with me a little bit that is definitely missing in today's world and it's in America and especially in politics. He was asked about McCain. Here it is. What's the greatest lesson you learned from him? Oh, to, to forgive. Um, you know, his uh, people talk about uh, they had a temper. It was passionate. That's certainly the case. Uh, but he would quickly forgive and move on. And to see the good in his opponents, uh, that is something that uh, particularly these days we could use a lot more of. Uh, that's a lesson that he taught everyone. So a part of me understands that Jeff Flake might have said that as a dig to Trump because he doesn't like Trump. And Trump is not someone who sees the good in his opponents a lot of the times. But really, if you step back and listen to that comment, it is something that's missing in our politics on all sides. On all sides. All you have to do is go on Twitter and say something that someone disagrees with, and you can see the hate and the anger that's out there. The idea of forgiving someone you disagree with in politics in today's world, no matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever it is, is something that is not popular in today's world. And it's something that I think he's right, that we need to learn that lesson from McCain, and we need to be better at this. Because our society, our civil society, will fall apart if we're not. Now, uh, Tom Brokaw was on Meet the Press as well, and he was asked about John McCain, and he said something similar. Go ahead and play that for me, Ron. We got along extremely well for a while, and then he got angry with me about what (laughs) what was never quite clear. But then he came to me about two years ago and said, look, I was wrong. We've got to get back to square one again. I don't know another politician who could talk like that. And I heard this from several different sources over the weekend that McCain was passionate. McCain could get very angry, had a temper. McCain could say some nasty things to people. But then a couple weeks later, he would call them and say, you know, water under the bridge. Let's move on. I, you know, I forgive you. And they would forgive each other and move on. Politics is messy. Politics is dirty. But it doesn't mean we have to hate each other forever. I think, and some people are going to say I'm soft for saying this, by the way. But I think this is something that I wish we could have more in our political discussions today. The idea of if you disagree with someone on the other side, I'm not saying you have to start agreeing with them. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you have to hate them doesn't mean you have to have the worst kind of anger and vitriol towards them merely for disagreeing on politics. There are many facets to an individual that go beyond politics. I have friends who I disagree with a lot on politics, but I can still be friends with them without giving up my convictions. I'm not saying we should give up convictions or beliefs or principles, but I'm saying one of those beliefs, one of those principles should be forgiveness, should it not? Republicans, conservatives, used to believe in the idea of forgiveness. We used to believe in the idea of having the moral high ground. We've Too many of us don't want that anymore because it, we think it's weakness. I'm going to get preachy on here just for a sec, but if you ever hear me talk about the show, on this show we talk faith, culture, and politics. That's what we talk about here on Beyond Reason Radio. I'm not going to shy away from my faith. And I was at a a church service last night, and we were reading through the book of Colossians, and it kind of hit me as all of this news was going on. And it's from Colossians chapter 3, and it talks about the way you used to live before you were a Christian and the way you should live now after you're saved. Is Paul talking to the church of Colossae. He says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. 
He says uh, later in uh, verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You can criticize me for talking about this, for pointing this out, for saying this. No, no. Hallelujah. Preach, brother. (laughs) Good stuff. These aren't my words. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. And many people listening to me right now, and many people on all sides of the political spectrum who say they are Christians don't want to hear this. But we need to hear this as Christians because all those things I read, especially the first part, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips, filthy language from your lips. All you have to do is go on Facebook and mention something political and you will hear Christians have the filthy language on their lips and all those things I, I just mentioned. We are not supposed to do those things Even to the people we don't like. We are instead supposed to be humble and kind and compassionate and gentle and patient. None of those things, it seems like, exists in our political spectrum anymore. None of those things exist in our culture anymore. None of those things exist in our country anymore in enough places. And they need to. Because they are powerful and they are right. And this is something I see all the time. I'm not saying give up your convictions, but I'm saying if you are a Christian, which I know a lot of you are, and you say you believe in these things, it's time that we as Christians start acting like it. Because if we don't, we have given up our moral credibility, the moral high ground, and we will lose more and more people for the faith. That goes for Trump. That goes for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or some of these really radical people like Rosie O'Donnell on the left, although I don't think she's a Christian. That goes for all these pundits on MSNBC or on Fox News. We can disagree peacefully, but I it seems like it's impossible. We have to get rid of the vindictiveness and the anger. Now, there is something else, though that I noticed in the coverage over the weekend, kind of on the other side of this, that I want to get to on how a lot of these pundits react to McCain's death. That also kind of fascinated me. So we're going to talk about that next. If you want to comment on anything we're saying, you can give us a call, 407-916-5400, or text to 23680, where standard message and data rates apply. I'm filling in for Carl Jackson tonight, a special edition of Beyond Reason Radio, and we will be right back. If you miss any of the show, you can download the Beyond Reason podcast on iTunes. The voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason is back now. Yes, welcome back to the show. This is Beyond Reason Radio, Orlando Smart Talk Radio. If you want to find out more about me, you can follow me on Twitter at Beyond Reason. Or you can like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. Or you can just go to beyondreasonradio.com. And, of course, the podcasts are available anywhere that podcasts are available. Rob is producing tonight. And I have good news, Rob. I have very good news. Yay. My big gulp is still there. <laughs> Don't start. It is, we have has a, not been stolen yet. We have a string tied to it. I can't take it. <laughs> last, last time, a couple <laughs> weeks ago on the show, someone stole my big gulp during the show. Yeah. But I just went out there during the break, and it's still there. I, I had people very concerned before the start of the show on yeah. Facebook <laughs> saying, make sure. Somebody said I should keep the big gulp in here in the studio. I can't. It's no. against the yeah. rules. My goodness. I'll, I'll get thrown out. I'll, I'll get sent to the guillotine the by the engineers. will have your head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, But it's still there. So it's good news. We'll see if it lasts for <laughs> the whole entire show. We'll see. So we've been talking about uh, the death of John McCain, a lot of coverage over the weekend on it. 
President Trump tweeted this out in response. He said, my deepest sympathies and respect go out to the family of Senator John McCain. Our hearts and prayers are with you. There was a lot of controversy today because although the flags are supposed to be half staff everywhere after his death, the flags at the White House were at half staff yesterday, but not this morning. Some people think that was sort of a Trump wanting to dig at McCain again because he really, really did not like John McCain. And obviously McCain really, really did not like Trump. Uh, But that has changed as of this afternoon and this evening. They have put the flag back at half staff. Uh, Trump put out a statement, said, despite our differences on policy and politics, I respect Senator John McCain's service to our country and in his honor have signed a proclamation to fly the flag of the United States at half staff until the day of his internment. Uh, He released that today. So I'm glad he uh, came on board with that. We we need to get rid of the pettiness in a time with something like this. Just just do the right thing. Just do the right thing. So that was good. So there was something, though, I noticed in the coverage of John McCain's legacy. And it can be kind of wrapped up in one statement here. Tom Brokaw was on Meet the Press and asked about, you know, he covered McCain for many, many, many years as anchor of NBC News. And he was asked a little bit about John McCain's legacy and how what John McCain did is missing in today's politics. But there was something he said there that caught my attention. And he's not the only one who was bringing this up. A lot of the pundits and reporters over the weekend were saying something similar. And it caught my attention. Here's what Tom Brokaw said. Well, I think you achieved that by uh, sailing against the winds that are prevailing. For example, now, uh, both parties, they're more ideologues than they are authentic people in terms of looking at a problem, not just through the prism of being a Democrat or a Republican, but what is really needed to be done. And John McCain would do that. He was not trapped by his party label. I mean, he was very conservative on international affairs, but willing to take a look at domestic programs from a different perspective. We don't have that much anymore in politics. You know, I grew up at a time when in both parties, they got along, even though they had different ideal ideologies, but they had in the Senate, the giants of the Senate on both sides. And now we have everybody trapped into this kind of ideological box. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you can't move out of that box. I think the country is tired of that. So he's saying that one of the great things about John McCain and the problems with the Senate and Congress and politics today is that, you know, people are too ideological. That, That McCain was not an ideologue. That he was willing to do what was best for the country. This is kind of what I was hearing. He'd get rid of his ideology to do what's best for the country. And that's why they called him a maverick. And there were some big legislations where he would team up with Democrats and do something that was kind of against conservative principles. One of the main pieces of legislation that passed was McCain-Feingold, the campaign finance laws that he passed. A lot of people think that's unconstitutional. A lot of conservatives make a really great argument that it's unconstitutional. But you heard him say it over the over again. Ideology. We're in this ideological box. We have to get out of that because it's we're it's preventing us from getting stuff done and what doing what's best for the country. And here's my question, and this is a very honest question, and maybe somebody will have the answer. You can call four zero seven nine one six fifty four hundred or text to two three six eight zero. My question is this: What is wrong with ideology? What is wrong? with having an ideology. A lot of the media pundits, and usually it's people on the left who criticize Republicans when they say that. Republicans, conservatives are too ideological. There we go. I said it right that time. (laughs) Ideological. They're too ideological. They're not willing to compromise. I hear this all the time from the left, criticizing the right. But my question is, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with ideology? I looked up the definition of ideology on Google. This is what it says. Ideology means a system of ideas and ideals, especially one that forms the basics of economic or political theory and policy. Uh, Some synonyms or beliefs, ideas, ideals, principles, ethics, morals. So people are too stubborn in their beliefs or their principles or their ethics or their morals. That's a bad thing. 
Um, another, you know, another definition, the ideas and manner of thinking characteristic of a group, social class, or individual. Um, another way is the science of ideas, the study of their or- origin and nature. But the first one is really what Tom Brokaw is talking about, an ideology. And we think, well, some, some people are too ideo- ideological. You know, yeah, you believe in small government. You believe that that's unconstitutional. It goes against the Constitution, but you're being too ideological. Get rid of your ideology and vote for this big spending package or vote for this bill, even though it goes against the Constitution. And they say that's the problem. But to me, I think sometimes when people are being too ideological, it's because they really believe in the ideology. You know, I'm a conservative because I really believe in limited government. And some people might say I'm too bound in this ideological box and I'm too much in my convictions. And you need to be willing to compromise more because we have to get stuff done. But usually, not always, but sometimes when you compromise, You compromise your values, your principles. Is that what we want in politicians? That's kind of what these pundits are saying. And the reason why Tom Brokaw and others are saying that is because they're Democrats and most of them are leftists and they realize that the only way to get their leftist agenda passed in Congress is for Republicans to compromise on their principles and come over to the other side and pass a lot of this stuff. They loved John McCain because he was a maverick. He was willing to pass some of these Democrat stuff in the name of compromise. And people like me or Ted Cruz are too ideological. But I ask again, what's wrong with ideology? If you really believe in it, if you really believe in your core principles, if you really believe in those values, maybe standing up for ideology isn't a bad thing. I think I hear what you're saying. I think the problem comes when you go against common sense. If your, if your ideas are against common sense, if they're against society's norms, if, they're, if they hurt people, if any of those are in your ideological spectrum, then I think that's where well, you have to have a little compromise, a little change, and well, here, here's the not thing. be so rigid on everything is exactly my ideas and everybody has to agree or you're wrong. Well, here's the thing. And sometimes you have to be willing to uh, change your mind if you have come to a different you know, you really study, really thought about it, and you realize I was wrong before. But here's the thing. There are wrong ideologies. I'm not saying all ideologies are equal. I'm not saying all ideologies are right. There are definitely wrong ideologies. But if you really believe in it and your ideology is good and you believe in your principles and sticking up for your principles, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the problem isn't that we're too ideological. I think the real problem is that we're too, you know, a lot of times we have problems with our politician is they're not ideological enough. And what that means is that they put party before principle. I think that's really the issue. There's a difference between standing up for your principles and standing up for your party. Cause there's a lot of times where politicians will put their party first and give up their principles. And I think that's where the real issue is. And Tom Brokaw kind of said that, but I think to him, it's that we have to compromise on our ideology. Let's take a call here. Let's go to James. Uh, James, how are you tonight? I'm doing okay. Uh, You made one error in the statement there, I think. You said conservative ideology, but you said leftist agenda. And it's not that. It's conservative and leftist and moderate ideologies are all in conflict. Yeah. And the problem there is a lot of the same buzzwords and phrases are used by all of them. And you have to look at who is actually doing common sense principled actions. Okay, and who is? Because I don't... Because, I mean, well, usually, I when, usually when someone is blamed for being too ideolog- ideological... They blame conservatives, but a lot of times it's maybe the left's ideology has become too radical and against American values. And we have to stand up for our principles because their principles are wrong. 
Absolutely. For instance, there's no longer any kind of vocational training in high school. No metal shop, no wood shop. Right. Okay? People need to know how to use a hammer, a level, a screwdriver. Where are they supposed to learn that if not in high school? Yeah, that's true. All right, I appreciate your call, James. Uh, Interesting topic on that. It was just something I noticed. I'm not saying that sometimes maybe we do need to compromise to get the best result, you know, to get something that like, like for instance, if you believe in cutting spending and you want to cut, you know, a billion dollars out of the budget, that's too low a number, but that's, I'm just using this for example, and you can only get 500 million cut. Well, you're still getting something cut. So you're not giving up your principles on that. You're just not getting up. You're compromising a little bit on how much. But I think sometimes, and a lot of people talk about this, they really want conservatives to completely give up their principles and their beliefs because it's getting in the way of of their their ideology and their agenda. 407-916-5400, text to 23680, where standard message and data rates apply. So unfortunately, we had another mass shooting in Florida. I don't know why we have to have all this stuff happen in Florida guy wasn't even from florida there's a lot of different questions coming out of what happened here in jacksonville it was at a madden game tournament and of course the same issues have come up that always come up after these shootings gun control mental illness better security and video games that's another one but i heard rick scott yesterday governor rick scott And he said some things that really resonated with me, and I think he's right. And we're going to play that next here on Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you heart Beyond Reason Radio, listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. This is Orlando's Smart Talk Radio. Beyond Reason Radio continues now. Yes, welcome back to the show. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Beyond Reason R or like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe, filling in for Carl Jackson tonight doing the show. Carl Jackson um, is out tonight. He will be back, though. This is not a permanent thing. So if you are hoping to catch him tonight, he'll be back next week. I believe he's making an appearance on Tucker's show. Tucker read one of his columns. He writes for Town Hall Magazine, Carl Jackson, and um, uh, read one of his columns on townhall.com and wanted to get him on the show. So so good deal for him. That's that's really awesome. So he'll be back for a special edition of Beyond Reason tonight. The, one, the next thing I wanted to talk about, the other big news, especially in the state of Florida, is there was another mass shooting. This has been how many in recent years? You have Parkland. You have the shooting at the warehouse in Winter Park where a guy shot five of his coworkers. You have Pulse nightclub shooting, of course. And you have this one. This one happened at a Madden NFL 19 gaming tournament in Jacksonville. By the way, the Madden video game, the graphics are just unbelievable now. I remember Super Nintendo days where Madden, it was like, Not even cartoon quality trying to play that game. And now it's like watching, almost watching it on TV. I remember Pong. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little bit before my time. (laughs) But, I mean, just amazing how how the games, I mean, that's beside the point. But he was a part of this, a part of this tournament. And these video game tournaments are a big deal. I was reading a story a couple of months ago that colleges are wanting to start up video game teams at their college and grant people scholarships based on how good they are on certain video games so they can be on video game teams and be a part of these video game tournaments for the school. So and so some kids win money from these tournaments and are able to pay college with the money. It's it's quite a thing. I'm not a gamer. I'm very very bad at video games, so I just kind of stay away from them. But uh, I was a young young kid, 24 years old. I'm not going to say his name. I'm kind of one of these people who believes that we shouldn't be uh, saying the shooter's name because part of what they want is fame. Um, He had a handgun. He actually had two handguns, 
and extra ammunition inside the restaurant where the competition was taking place, what they said at a news conference today. He used one of the handguns. He had bought an aftermarket laser to aim. And there's video out there. You can see the red dot, and it's just, it's just chilling. It's just awful. And uh, there are reports that he uh, had mental illness problems in the past, had been hospital, hospitalized for mental illness in the past. He was kind of a loner. Um, he killed two people and then himself. So the same questions always come up with this. You have the gun control question. How was this kid able to buy a gun? Apparently, he just was able to legally buy a gun. He had a background check. It's not like it was had anything to do with the gun show loophole that they talk about. He went in, bought it, had Pass a background check. Um, some say we need to ban assault weapons. This was not an assault weapon. So banning assault weapons is not going to do any good. So some, he had mental history, mental illness. So some people say we need to address that. How do we address the mental illness problem? Um, there is some uh, speculation that he might have been on, you know, some of these antipsychotic drugs. Some people are against that. I tend to believe that the reason why most of these mass shooters are on these antipsychotic drugs is because they're already mentally ill. The chances of them, the chances of someone who's mentally ill being on a drug is higher than someone who's not mentally ill being on one of those drugs. So I think it's, I think that's really the reason for that. But Rick Scott, governor Rick Scott, who's had to deal with too many of these mass shootings. He was asked about this yesterday. And he had a comment that I thought was really interesting. And I think he's right. I really do. This is what he said. What would cause this this young man, okay, another young man, and then to, I mean, they're not valuing life, okay? Something is causing that. Um, And the, as as a society, we've got to figure this out. Every parent's got to say to themselves, you know, what can I do better, all right? And our church leaders, and, and, have to say themselves, what what can we be doing to get people more involved in faith? Um, Because when I was growing up, this was not happening, Um, and it's happening now. We all have to stop and say to ourselves, we're fed up. We're fed up with not having a conversation about the reason this is now this is happening. And he was saying he's fed up. We're not talking about the reason this was happening. We need to focus on the fact that by far the vast majority of these mass shooters are young men. And when he's saying we have to ask ourselves, why? What is it about these young men that makes them not value life and that makes them want to take other people's lives and their own in a lot of cases? What is it? And he says... Our church leaders need to get involved with this. Parents need to get involved with this. It's more than just getting rid of the gun because if the gun is just the tool here, if you get rid of all the guns in this country, which is impossible, let's say you can't, let's say you can get rid of every single gun in this country. Is that going to change what's going on in that person's mind? The person who shot this person or the Parkland kid, is that going to change what they're dealing with, the evil that's in their minds and in their hearts? Is that going to change it by getting rid of the gun, getting rid of the tool? No, they're still going to have those evil intentions in their minds. They're still going to have those evil intentions in in their heart. You are getting rid of the tool, but you are not helping fix the problem. And that's what Rick Scott is saying here. He says, yeah, we can talk about guns and we want to limit their access of guns. But someone who is that determined to kill their fellow man is going to find a way to kill their fellow man. Killing their fellow man, men killing men is not new. The tool might be new in terms of history, but that's not new. And he's saying we have to address the real issue, which is why these young men don't value life. And he had mentioned faith, and I think faith is a huge part of it. There's something else that I just read here. Um, According to Fox News here, his parents were going through a a bad divorce and a bad custody battle and all that before. We find that in a lot of these cases that they come from broken homes in some way or another. That's, I think, the lack of real family values is a problem. 
I think that does not help the situation. He might have had that when he was younger, but if he was 24. I mean, your parents get divorced at 24. It's not going it, to, that, that shouldn't be an excuse. I mean, that, you should be on with your own life. This guy definitely had a disconnect from reality. Well, but what I'm, well they divorced in 2007. So that so was, was years younger, ago. Yeah, he was younger. But what I'm saying is it was probably problems in the home before maybe. I don't know. I mean, that's just one thing I'm throwing out. Sometimes it's the lack of the father in the home. I tend to believe it's it's the lack of God and the lack of faith. And, th- and this is my thoughts on this. I, in you know, getting preachy again, but oh well. <laughs> um, I believe that because of postmodernism in the years coming up, that we have kind of created a spiritual vacuum in this society because we wanted to kind of get away from God and get away from our beliefs and all that. So we've kind of created this big spiritual vacuum. Well, now when you have a vacuum, a big spiritual vacuum or any kind of vacuum, that vacuum wants to be filled. So now you have very different competing forces out there trying to fill that spiritual vacuum that we have created in our society. And there are different ways to fill. And in some ways it's evil. You know, this kid, this kid might've been really addicted to video games. He might've thought that being the winner at being the best gamer ever was how he was going to find fulfillment and find real accomplishment in his now life. Now you're getting somewhere. Yeah. Cause he, he lost, he was a champion last year and then he loses this year. And he is so mad about losing his whole identity is that being a champion of this NFL game. And then he loses. Exactly. Boom, I'm going to kill you. Exactly. Straight, straight from, you know, I'm the champion to I'm going to kill you because you beat me. Yeah. Because that's, you're right, that's where he got his identity. A video game is how he got, he found fulfillment in his soul. He was trying to fill that vacuum with that, and you can't. You can't fill your soul with that and expect that to satisfy you. It's not going to work. And then in some of these other mass shootings, the one in Winter Park I was saying, it was a co-worker, he was trying to, he lost his job. Sometimes our job becomes our identity. The Parkland shooter. He felt alone. He was he was mad at the world. And who knows what he was filling his stuff with. And then they get triggered. Want the, firing yeah. from your job, losing the big tournament, whatever the trigger is. Exactly. Exactly. And then you have Mateen, the Pulse nightclub shooter. He found a different ideology, a radical. He was a radical Islamic terrorist. So he was a part of the spiritual vacuum. And you know what filled that vacuum for him? It was that terrorist, radical terrorist religion out there. There's always something. There are different evil forces out there trying to fill that spiritual vacuum in the world. I truly believe that. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. And it's, of course it's going to affect young men in this way because young men are obviously going to be more aggressive. They're obviously going to be more violent. It's in our biology. And if you don't instill godly spiritual values that you know the ones i started the show with they're going to have that man that nature and instead of using that manly nature to better themselves or to protect their families or to want to accomplish real accomplishments or help their fellow man they're gonna use that nature to kill or destroy and I think that's what's happening. I mean, let me see if I can find the verse that I started the show with. What did I do with it here? I had it, I promise. Um, Yeah, here it is from Colossians. I'll read it again before we take a break. If you're a Christian, it says, you must now also rid yourself as such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Your lips. Colossians 3, verse 5, uh, verse, that was verse 8. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's what the spiritual vacuum needs to be filled with in this culture, in this world, in these young men. So they will use that manly nature for good. 
but it's empty for a lot of these people and they're filling it with stuff like video games and other stuff. Do you agree or disagree? 407-916-5400. Text to 23680 or standard message and data rates apply. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. It would be beyond reason not to listen to Yaffe on your TuneIn Radio app. Download the app today and search Beyond Reason Radio. The conscience in your ear telling you the difference between right and wrong. Yaffe is back on the air. So Big Gulp update to the Big Gulp has not been stolen yet from outside the studio. I know everyone is very concerned. As last time I did the show, my Big Gulp disappeared on me. There was a thief, a Big Gulp thief, but it's still out there. So everything is good. That means the show can go on. It can continue. So I appreciate you listening to the show. This is Beyond Reason Radio. Carl Jackson will be back next week. We've been talking about that mass shooting that happened at the Madden uh, gaming tournament in Jacksonville. And uh, I just have to say, you know, our culture has decided that there is no such thing as truth and everything is relative. And because of that, we have created a spiritual vacuum and now it's being filled with some evil things out there. And I think that's a big cause of it. Let's go to a, take a call here. Let's go to Carlos. Uh, Carlos, thanks for listening to the show. How are you? All right. And yourself? Well, I'm good. I like your calm demeanor and reading scripture on a talk show. Very different. Uh, Um, Thank you. Two things I just want to say, and I won't belabor the time. I know it's short. One is um, desensitization. And what we have is, if if you think about every movie has every five minutes a scene with a gun in it. And it's almost, I hate to say, and this may be correctly to say, it's almost interesting that that happens at a video game. These video games are just more and more and more violent. So if we're going to challenge the 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 churches to step step up, we need to challenge the video game people because we're infiltrating very young minds, and just knocking someone off in a video game is really translating to how easy it is to exert violence. The final thing is, um, we get into this battle of uh, who I'm for and who against, like a football game. It's in politics, yeah. it's everything. Yeah. And we really shouldn't be for or against guns. We need to just say, back in the day, you had to fight. You didn't have act so much easy access to guns. And I'm probably older than you, but it just wasn't such easy access. And they can clean up some of these guns on the street if they really want to and put some real mandatory guidelines like they do on drugs and make it really difficult to say if you have one and you use it, you don't have to kill yourself because you're not going to see daytime. And, and, and we need to stop this for and against. Just like you said earlier, right is right and wrong is wrong. You said it in a different way. You know, so well, I, I, really got us. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, I definitely agree with you that we live in a culture now where, yeah, for and against. And when we're against someone, we hate them and they're evil. And that's not always the case. <laughs> we might disagree or we might just be on different teams Literally in sports, that's what this was, but it doesn't mean you have to kill them if you lose. Well, and that's not the video game for one against us. Politics is everything. Yeah, you know, it's in everything. You're know, right. It's everything. Yeah, everything you're, is a football game. Yeah, you're, exa- you're exactly right. I appreciate your call. I mean, you know, in sports, when you're in Little League or something, one of the things that they would have kids do is after the game, they would shake hands um, to show, you know, this is just a game. But he's right in everything in our culture. You have this for and against mentality. I'm okay. You're not okay is what it says that if you don't agree with me and you're not on my team, then you're evil. And when you believe that you're going to kill for it. If you believe that the other side, even in politics, that's what really worries me about the political culture today, because we've become to a point in this society where we believe if someone disagrees with our politics, they're evil. And when you actually believe that someone who disagrees with their politics is evil, the next step is going to be violence, and that's not good. That is bad, but that's the road we're going down, and it's troubling. Now, a couple other things he said. The video game thing, I'm not convinced yet. Well, the, those first shooters and the war videos, that's how they train the soldiers these days. That's true, you, and that's a good point. Like I said, I, I could be convinced. 
They have done some studies, though, that show that it, video games might actually cause less violence because you get out your aggression on the game instead of in real life. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I, I'm not a gamer, so maybe I'm not an expert in this. I'll have to talk to someone else. All right, we have one more hour to go. Much more to get to. We have the whole Trump uh, Cohen controversy. Democrats already calling for his impeachment, basically. We'll talk about that next and much more. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. One more hour to go, and I will be right back. Beyond Reason Radio. Yes, another hour, of course, of Beyond Reason Radio with me, Michael Yaff, your voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. If you were expecting to hear Carl Jackson tonight, he could not do the show tonight, so he had asked me if I wanted to do my show in in his stead. So I said, okay, sure, great. So a special Monday night edition, Carl Jackson will be back next week. I believe he was making an appearance on the Tucker show on Fox News. So that's good. He has a column in Town Hall magazine in townhall.com. Uh you can check that out as well. A really good writer and really good person. So he'll be back next week. Don't worry, but special edition beyond Reason Radio tonight. We are on till 10 p.m. right here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. We talked a lot of about a lot of different things in the first hour. Talked about John McCain, talked about the shooting in Jacksonville and uh, a lot more. So if you missed any of the first hour, you can check out the podcast anywhere podcasts are available. And of course we have Rob who is uh, producing tonight. How are you? Rob? Glad to be here. All right. So in this hour, uh, it's going to be a lot more Trump stuff in this hour, not too much Trump stuff in the first hour. I did mention them a couple of times, but a lot more Trump stuff because of course you can't do a show like this. (laughs) You know, we're talking faith, (laughs) culture and politics and you can't talk about politics these days without talking about trump especially that's what everyone is obsessed with and of course the big news that happened last week in which it seemed like the sky the sky was falling and trump was going to be sent to jail immediately was this revelation that came well this plea agreement from michael cohen his former attorney now his former attorney pleaded guilty to tax fraud and other things, but also to campaign finance violations. And he said he was paying off women like Stormy Daniels and there was other women at the behest of the candidate, at the direction of the candidate. There's a lot of people that are saying because of that, that Trump knew about it and directed it, that that means Trump is a co-conspirator in campaign and finance violations. Now, there's going to be a lot of uh, different arguments on the legalities of all of this, on the potential for impeachment and the dangers for Trump. All of that's been speculated. We're going to get to a lot of that in this. We're going to get to a lot of that in the next segment. But there was one thing I want to focus on right now. was one thing I noticed in this debate. Because basically, where you are on Trump doing something illegal or not, or Trump being in real trouble or impeachment, basically your stance on that depends on where you are politically. So the right, Republicans, conservatives are like, well, it might be look bad, but you know he's not really in a lot of trouble. It really doesn't affect him. And then if you're on the left or you're a Democrat, it's practically that this is an impeachable offense. He broke the law. He can't be trusted. He's corrupt. This is what I hear over and over and over again. So where you are politically usually is where you stand on these issues. And I'll give some examples of that later. And this really, by the way, this really frustrates me because I guarantee you if Trump was a Democrat, let's say Trump's a Democrat and he's president and he's guilty of the exact same thing as a Democrat. I guarantee you all of these people who say Trump should be impeached and Trump is corrupt and doing all these illegal things and should be put in jail. I guarantee you that all of those people on the left would be defending Trump today if he was a Democrat politician. 
And I guarantee you that all of these people on the right who are saying Trump didn't do anything wrong, that it's not a big deal, that this is a left-wing FBI conspiracy against him, a witch hunt, I guarantee you all those people on the right would be saying, lock him up, lock him up. I guarantee you that is where we would be today if theoretically, if or hypothetically, Trump was a Democrat politician. That's what frustrates me so much about all this because it's just politics. All of this is a political game. I've been saying that from the beginning, and I really believe that most of this is just a political game. The Democrats might go for his impeachment if they win the House. Why are they going to do that? Because, because it's politically expedient. They want to they help their base. They want to look good. But they know they can't convict him. They know they don't have enough votes in the Senate. So there's no way that even if they impeach him in the House, that he's going to be convicted in the Senate. So it's just a political show. It's just a political game, and they know it. If they controlled the Senate, they wouldn't try for impeachment. Why? Because they like having Trump as their enemy. One, they don't want Mike Pence to be president. They don't like him. But two, they like having Trump as their enemy. So they want to use this now for politics, even though there are a lot of, uh, I've noticed a lot of Democrats trying to go away from it a little bit, saying, oh, well, we don't want to focus on impeachment right now. We want to focus on the economy and all that. But I think all of this is politics, and it all depends on where you are on the political side of what you think about this. But there is one thing that I noticed that nobody is arguing about, and I think it's uh, kind of disturbing when you think about it. Nobody is arguing that Trump did not have those affairs. Have you noticed that? There is no one out there saying Trump didn't have those affairs. This is all to make him look bad. He only had Melania. He, he was just paying off those women because he wanted to look okay, but he really didn't have those affairs. He's a great one-woman guy. Notice how nobody's arguing that. His infidelity is not in question. Exactly. His infidelity is not in question. It's not in question by people on the left, but it's also not in question by people on the right. Even most Trump supporters... Uh, will probably agree that Trump had all these affairs. Because we knew that going in. Trump was a guy who was on Howard Stern for years bragging about this kind of stuff. Trump had been through failed marriages before for this very reason. Nobody is arguing that, hey, Trump really didn't have these affairs. And my question is, is this a good thing for our country? That we don't care anymore that the president of the United States is a serial philanderer, at least was in his past. I think that's kind of troubling. Is it no one else troubled by this? And people will say, well, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, exactly. And I remember all the conservatives who love Trump now hated Bill Clinton because he was a man of impure character and was having these affairs. And now all of a sudden, because it's your guy... You don't care? Well, we're willing to look past that because he's a fighter. That's what I always hear. It's the reason why they love Trump. Yeah, he has all these problems, but he's a fighter and we need a fighter. Fight fire with fire. So character doesn't matter anymore? And people will always say to me, one, get off your high horse. Get off your high horse, Mike. Everyone makes mistakes. This is true. We're all sinners. Even Christians are sinners. But here's the problem. I've never heard Trump admit any of these sins. I never hear Trump admit doing wrong. The only time I heard Trump really apologize was after that tape of the Access Hollywood tape came out when he was saying he grabs women by the you-know-what, and he apologized. Of course, then later he said, well, that might have been edited or something. Remember that? And I remember when that tape came out, and I all, all these Trump People saying, well, that's just locker room talk. That's how people talk in the locker room. That's what Trump said, and some were agreeing with him. And I and I came on the air, filling in for Bud, and I said, why as Christians are we defending this? This is indefensible, what he said. I'm not saying you don't have to vote for him, but why are we defending this? Because it's not good what he said. 
Now, if he apologizes for it and admits that it was wrong, admits he shouldn't have said it, and admits that he is a changed man, maybe because of faith or something, then that's fine. Has Trump done any of those things? He kind of apologized for that tape. Has he apologized for these affairs? Has he admitted he's a changed man? Has he said anything that maybe that, you know, my faith has changed me or this office has changed me and I need to be a man of better character because I am now leading the free world? Have you heard any of that? No, I haven't. So we have a man who doesn't, he, I mean, he lied. He asked, he was asked, did you know that Cohen made these payments? He said, no, I didn't know. That was his original statement. Last week he said, I knew about it. I directed him and it's not illegal. That means you originally lied. Do we not care that he lied? I understand we love the politics. I understand we love the policies. So were we willing to go along with the lies, going along with the defects in character to put forward policy? As a person of faith, you have to be befuddled at how many commandments that he's broken. Just go down the top 10 commandments, just the top 10, Yeah, you know. How many? And we all do, and we all break them. Yes, I understand. But we try to we learn do. and get better, and not do them again. But there's, and again, you know, there's things that I've done wrong in my life, but I'm ashamed of those things because they're no wrong. shame. It's the lack of shame, and it's not just Trump. It's all over our culture. The lack of shame on doing things that are wrong that bothers me, and we're willing to look past it because he's on our side. I don't like this. And it's really not good for the future of the Republican Party. I know everyone thinks that Trump is save the Republican Party. And, you know, Trump has done a lot of good things policy wise. I've complimented him on this show many times over it. But though we on the right have lost our moral credibility, you all realize this. We have lost the moral high ground. We can no longer make the arguments that the Democrats are immoral when they're having affairs and all this other stuff. We can't make the argument. We can't make the Christian arguments anymore that we need Christian values and family values in this country now because we have a leader who has not followed any of those. How can we make the argument? We've lost the moral high ground. And people will tell me, this is what people will say. They will say, well, the left will criticize us no matter what. This is true. The left and a lot of the media will criticize you. It will never be good enough for them. But it's not them who you're trying to impress. It's the voters. And we were still winning a lot of elections because we had the moral high ground on a lot of these issues. We no longer have that moral high ground now because we have a president now who no one, no one is arguing that this guy did not have those affairs. We all know he did. And nobody has a problem with this. That bothers me. We should have a problem with it. We should condemn him for doing it. We should expect him to apologize for doing it and admit he did something wrong. But we don't. And I guarantee you, a lot of people listening right now will tell me that um, I'm caving in. I'm caving into the left. I'm caving in to I'm not willing to fight. I'm willing to fight on principle. If you've listened to this show, I'm as conservative as it gets on policy and ideology. But now we're trying to defend someone whose moral character isn't there. And your ideology has been with you before Trump. You're not going to change the fact that you don't believe in extramarital affairs. You don't believe in lying to your wife. You don't believe in all these things. You can't change. You just said it last hour. You can't change your ideologies to match your politics. Right. But that's what we're doing. You're in a little box there, Mike. It's what are you going to do? It's a box. <laughs> exactly. We're all, we're going, and it's all because of the team. It's all because of the game, the politics, and it's just annoying. I voted for Trump. I'll admit that right now. I voted for Trump. He seemed the best option at the time, and I'm really worried about the Democrats taking us to socialism. I'm very worried about us becoming more and more of a socialist country. When you read what the Democrats, like Bernie Sanders, want, that is fundamental transformation. That is why I voted for Trump. But we're too much to a point now where we defend them no matter what. And it's like, you know, we got to condemn some of this stuff or we're going to lose the moral high ground. 407-916-5400. Text to 23680. Now, I want to have an honest debate, though, about the legalities of all of this stuff. I'm going to play both sides on this issue on whether Trump is in real deep legal trouble or not. 
because I want to be fair on this. And then I want to give my take and uh, thinking a lot about this. And we'll take your calls as well. 407-916-5400, text to 23680. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. Listen to the latest episodes of Beyond Reason. Download the podcast at Spreaker.com. The place where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Beyond Reason Radio continues. Yes, welcome back to the show. This is Orlando Smart Talk Radio, where we talk faith, culture, and politics. And what people tell me is that means I am a glutton for punishment because those are the issues that we address first and foremost on this show. I appreciate you all joining me. We're on until 10 p.m. tonight right here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. I'm kind of filling in for Carl Jackson, who will be back next week. You can follow me on Twitter at Beyond Reason R. We've been talking about this whole controversy with uh, Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney, who has now pled guilty to uh, campaign finance violations. Excessive campaign contributions is what they have said because he has paid off these women. He said he did it at the direction of the candidate. So the big question is, how much legal trouble is Trump in or is he in any legal trouble? And I said before, usually the answer to this depends where you are on the political aisle. If you're on the left, you say he should be impeached today. And if you're on the right, you say he's innocent of all charges. So let's go over um, both both sides of this, and then I'll give my take. A uh, couple of different sides. One side was uh, from, well, some on the left, and a lot of people are saying this is worse than Watergate, and he is a co-conspirator to a big crime. Uh, one of these people was Jonathan Turley, who goes on Fox News as their legal analyst, and this is what he said about it. If the prosecutors accept what is in this indictment, then the president just became an unindicted co-conspirator. That's that's the simple matter of it. I mean, if if they believe that what's in this indictment is true and that he was directed to make this payment, they clearly believe the payment was a campaign finance violation, then the president just became an unindicted co-conspirator. And he could become an indicted co-conspirator depending on the timing and circumstances. Now, that's enough to concentrate the mind of any White House lawyer. Uh, this is far more dangerous than what happened with Manafort. The president's right. It's completely separate in that case from him. Cohen is not. All right. So he's saying that. Now, someone else who made a similar point was Nick Ackerman, who was a former Watergate prosecutor. He was on MSNBC, uh, I believe, Friday, right after all this broke. And this is what he said. This makes the president of the United States an unindicted co-conspirator. This is the first time this has happened since Richard Nixon was named as an unindicted, unindicted co-conspirator uh, in the Watergate trial. Yeah. Uh, this is a big I, I will say, deal. I don't- All right, so basically the same argument. This is a big deal. He's a co-conspirator. It's bigger than Watergate. He's going to end up being impeached and then maybe convicted and maybe even go to jail. That's what you've heard a lot of this. Now, I want to play the other side of this. Alan Dershowitz, who I play a lot in this show, he's usually a voice of reason. And I think he's right on this. Someone who voted, by the way, this is someone who voted for Hillary Clinton. He's saying it's not as doom and gloom as what everyone else is saying here. And he makes a good point, and this is what he said. If the president gave the money out of his own pocket, and that's now been disputed, but we have to see where the facts come out, if the president gave the money out of his own pocket, he's entitled to give a billion dollars. A candidate Trump could have announced, I'm funding my own campaign, I'm putting a billion of my dollars into the campaign, and I'm paying a hundred million of them to women who have accused me falsely, etc. That would not be a violation of any campaign law as long as he reported it. If he, if it was, if the campaign failed to report it, it would be on the campaign, not on the candidate himself. So if President Trump, candidate Trump, paid the money himself, uh, there'd be no violation of law at all, either for Cohen or for Trump. If, if on the other hand, Cohen did it on his own, made a campaign contribution of $280,000 to pay hush money to these women, that might be a campaign contribution, but that would be on Cohen and not on uh, President Trump. So what, what Dershowitz is basically saying there is that if Trump did direct Cohen to make this this payment, that means it's basically Trump making a campaign contribution to him, his own campaign. So he believes this is a campaign. Paying off these women would be a type of campaign contribution. 
And he believes that by Trump directing it, that means Trump paid, he paid it out of his corporation, that since he paid it, that means it's perfectly legal for him to do that because a candidate can contribute unlimited amounts to his own campaign. So if he thinks that legally this is just him can contributing to his own campaign and because he's contributing to his own campaign, he's able to contribute as much as he wants. Now what Dershowitz did say there also is that the only thing that might be illegal about this is the fact that they did not report this. When you make the campaign contribution like this, you have to report it to uh, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. They didn't report this. That would be illegal, but most of the time, and this happens all the time with candidates, when you don't report something and you get caught, you just pay a fine. Obama paid fines. The campaign paid fine. This has happened before. So that's why Dershowitz believes this is not a huge deal. It's not an impeachable offense, and it wouldn't be directed at Trump himself but it would be directed at the treasurer of the campaign because it is the responsibility of the treasurer of the campaign to make sure that is reported. And that's why this is not a big deal. And I think he makes a good point. Now there is another point to be made here. And Mark Levin, uh, he's, you know, worked for the former attorney general under Reagan. He's a lawyer himself for many books, a radio host. He makes the point that Trump didn't do anything wrong. This is what he said. A candidate who spends his own money or even corporate money for an event that occurred not as a result of the campaign is not making a campaign expenditure. Now, let me give you some examples. Let's say a candidate had said and was a big businessman. We owe vendors money. There's some dispute over this. Let's get them paid so it doesn't look bad for my campaign. And so I look good. Or let's say he settles a lawsuit that was initiated before the campaign or outside the campaign. But he doesn't want it to be an issue during the campaign. And he says to his lawyer, let's go ahead and settle that. There's absolutely nothing illegal about it. So what Mark Levin is saying there is not only is there nothing illegal about it, but the argument is that that's not even considered a campaign contribution. It's not settled law that him paying off these women would be considered a campaign contribution. It could be considered separate from the campaign because he's paid off women in the past. There's thoughts that he could, you could argue that he was going to pay them off no matter if he was in the campaign or not, or even if it was, he is in the campaign. This is separate from the campaign, so that really isn't a campaign contribution. I'm not a lawyer. All of this, I think it's going to be very hard to convict Trump of anything here because I just gave you basically three, four different arguments that are all going to be argued in court, and there's going to be a lot of reasonable doubt (laughs) going on legally. There's a lot of different. The waters of different, are murky. It is very murky it on is. this stuff. It could go either way, and it's, it's unprecedented. No, you yeah. don't know what it's going to happen. You don't know right. for sure he's going to be indicted. You don't know for sure he's going to get off. It's it's never been down this road. It's so, never been down right. this road. So the left who thinks that this is a done deal, he's going to be convicted. Going to be. It's just. I'm telling you, it's just not certain. There are too many different arguments to be made here, on this. There, there just is. And the lawyers on both sides are going to make all these different arguments. That being said, remember, impeachment is more a political thing. The Democrats can impeach him if, for whatever reason, they see fit. As long as they have the votes, they can do it. So we'll see where this goes. I tend to think that he's, his campaign is going to be found to have made illegal campaign contributions. But I don't think it's going to go much further than that. I think it's going to be very, very difficult to really get Trump himself on this. But they're propping this out because it's politics. It makes Trump look bad, so they're going to keep going on and on and on. But like, I mean, you put it, you put it well, Rob. It's murky. It's too murky. 
you you can't bank on this alone. It doesn't make now it doesn't make Trump look good. Like I said, basically nobody's arguing that he hasn't had these affairs. You have on tape that he probably knew about it. He has basically admitted to lying originally saying he didn't know about it because he, he has recently said he didn't know about it and directed it. So none of this makes Trump look good. It doesn't make him look like a decent person. But when you step back and just look at the legal ramifica- ramifications of this, it, it could go either way. 407-916-5400. Text to 23680. Do you think Trump could possibly be impeached or prosecuted over this? I mean, the Democrats, if they win the House, they're probably going to try to impeach him. I'm still not 100 con- 100% convinced on that because... I think they like having him as the enemy, but we'll see. 407-916-5400. You can text to 23680. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. Download the iHeartRadio app and catch the Beyond Reason Radio podcast. Your voice of truth in a world of fake news. Beyond Reason Radio continues right now. Yes, welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of truth. As it said there, we have Rob producing as well. If you were expecting to hear Carl Jackson tonight, usually he does his show Monday nights, 8 to 10 p.m. Uh, he couldn't do it tonight, so he asked me to do my show. He should be back next week, so I appreciate him giving me the time to do my show. We talked about a lot of different things. We talked about John McCain talked about the shooting in Jacksonville. We've talked about uh, Trump's affairs. We've talked about Trump and the whole Cohen uh, plea plea deal and all that, pleading guilty and the legal ramifications against Trump and all of that. If you missed anything, catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are available. Make sure to like the Beyond Reason Facebook page and catch the video there as well. So... Because politics and sports are now intermingled in everything, it seems like. Politics is involved in everything these days, it seems like. Now Tiger Woods is involved in some kind of political controversy. Yes, the golfer Tiger Woods, who's trying to kind of make a comeback, you know, after he had his whole problem with his affair and his breakup, and he had injuries as well. He was kind of out of not doing very well in the golf world. He's kind of made a comeback, been doing a lot better. And a lot of people hope he does well because he brings a lot of fans to the sport. That's just a fact. And don't sugarcoat it. It's affairs. He had plenty of off the, yeah, off yeah. the cuff affairs against yeah. his wife. Yes. Sure. He's no, he's he's... no pretty boy or whatever you want to say. Choir boy. <laughs> no, choir yeah, boy. He's no choir boy. That is for sure. Um, but Tiger Woods. He was asked, um, this was after a tournament in New Jersey during a press conference. Tiger Woods was asked, of course, about his thoughts on President Trump. Because this is what we do now. We have to ask athletes, these sports stars, what they think about the president and politics and all of this stuff. Why? I don't know, but this is what we have to do. So Tiger Woods said something pretty interesting and got a lot of flack for it. What did he say that was so terrible? Well, here it is. He's the president of the United States, and you have to respect the, the, the office. And no matter who's in the office, um, you may like, dislike um, personality or the, the politics, uh, but we all must respect the office. He said you have to respect the office. You might not like the guy's politics or personality, but he's still the president of the United States. You have to respect the office. I mean, they had been friends, well, not really friends, kind of friendly for years. They had played golf together. They kind of know each other. But he was asked about this, and that's what Tiger Woods said. Respect the office. How dare he? Why did he not use his position of power, which is just golf, to criticize the president of the United States? How could he do this, especially as an African-American himself? And then, of course, Tiger Woods was also asked about the state of race relations in this country, and this was even worse. How could he answer this way? This is what he said. No, I just finished 72 holes and really hungry. So he, he said, he was asked, do you want to talk about it? And he said, no, uh, I just finished this. I'm really hungry. I just have to say thank you, Tiger Woods. Thank you for being this way. I wish most athletes were this way. Play the sport, talk about the sport, and get on with your life. Now, uh, President Trump tweeted out about this, of course, which is not going to help Tiger Woods, unfortunately. 
This is what Trump tweeted out. He said the fake news media worked hard to get Tiger Woods to say something that he didn't want to say. Tiger wouldn't play the game. He is very smart. More importantly, he is playing great golf again. Now, there's something here Trump said that he's exactly right on. 100% right Trump is. And that's this part. Tiger Woods wouldn't play the game. Trump is right. Because that's what this is. It's a game. He would play golf, but in terms of trying to get all these athletes involved in the political sphere, it's a game. It's to get the sound bite so your side, your team can get another notch in its belt or whatever you want, another trophy. It's a game. And Tiger Woods doesn't want to play. He doesn't want to play this game of getting athletes involved into politics. And really, he is smart. You know, I was listening to something earlier, and it made a lot of sense. You know, Michael Jordan was would stay out of politics as well. And he said the reason why is because Republicans buy sneakers too. Why would you want to get all these athletes involved in politics when possibly half the country or half your audience or half your fans are on that side of the political aisle? But most importantly, why do we care what these athletes think about politics? We like them because they are extremely skilled and extremely talented at their sport. They're good at their sport. So why don't we try this? Why don't we talk to them about the sport? Because that's their expertise. Tiger Woods' expertise is not politics. It's not really race relations, not any of this other stuff. I mean, if he wants to comment on it, he can. It's fine. It's a free country. But the media should be asking him about what he's expert at, which is the game of golf. They should ask LeBron James what he's expert at, which is the game of basketball. I was just going to say you're headed towards what LeBron James took the bait, played the game. Yeah. and It's a game. Laura Ingraham came back or Ingram came back and said, just shut up and dribble. Yeah. And that was the famous quote. And then now LeBron James has turned that just shut up and dribble into a whole a whole a whole movement. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole thing. He has a TV show coming out now, a documentary, a whole thing just called uh, Shut Up and Dribble. So he's using that yeah. as a platform to, you know, elevate himself. And, and more athletes are getting involved. Every aspect, you know, of course with the NFL, NBA not going to the White House. Yeah. It's all they're kind of trying to get into politics, but they don't want to go all the way cuz they might not sell enough shoes. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's just um, you know, Tiger Woods, one thing he said there that I really liked, he he didn't say he loved Trump or anything or loved Trump's politics. He said, "Look, I just respect the office." And I want to talk about it because I'm here to play golf. <laughs> you know, let me talk about that. And you know, about the Laura Ingram thing, the shut up and dribble comment, a lot of people thought that was racist. But Laura Ingram has said similar things in the past. She said thing about singers, you know, shut, shut up and sing. So yeah. it's not a race thing. We we want to make everything racist, but it's not a new thing. And, you know, you have a right to talk politics no matter where you are. But if I'm a sports reporter and I'm talking to one of the greatest athletes in the history of the game, don't you think I would want to talk to him about the game that he plays? That was the biggest problem with a lot of the the talk radio, the sports talk radio and the sports ESPN TV shows is they were getting into political stuff. And I am like, what happened to the days when we talked about the game, the strategy of the actual sport? That's why I, I tune into you. And even ESPN took the stand. They're not going to show and CBS are not going to show the national anthem this year on the football games. They're going to go to commercial, I guess. Yeah. So you know, I a, heard, you know, I heard, I don't know if this is hundred percent true. Maybe you would know. But I heard that they really didn't show the anthem that much until after this controversy started. Sure. And during military week, they would because they'd have the huge flag unveiling. Yeah. And they would have yeah. like the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl, of course, they do that. And if it's a big singer, they want to highlight the big singer yeah. like in the Super Bowl. But usually they, they try to either come in before they get the whole anthem in or the whole anthem out. Right. I know like maybe during the Magic Games on radio, they might come in from a break and play a commercial and yeah. then right during the end of the anthem. So yeah. just play the last line of the anthem and the broadcasters take over there. Yeah, I mean, I tune in this stuff for the sport. And what you know what the other side will say. You know what they'll say about 
why Tiger Woods needs to speak up because Trump is so evil that you have to speak up no matter who you are because Trump is just that evil. Conservatives and Republicans are just that evil and he's just that racist. He has to speak up and he's like, no, I respect the office. He's the president. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about golf. So I I appreciate Tiger Woods for that. I think Trump's right. It's just a game. I, I really do. I think it's all just a game. 407 916 5400. Text to 23680. Um, more to say on the show. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. Subscribe to the Beyond Reason podcast today on your Stitcher app and hear the voice of reason anytime. Your safe space for conservative thought, not for political correctness. Yaffe is back right now. Been a jam-packed two hours, I guess. It's almost over. We have a few minutes here. Uh, a couple things I definitely want to talk about here. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. Carl Jackson will be back next week. We have Rob producing as well. Don't forget to like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. So, um, big news that came out today out of the Trump administration, and this is obviously a big deal to Trump because really deep in Trump's heart, his number one issue is trade. He's been talking about it for 30 years, the bad trade deals. And apparently we have a new NAFTA agreement. It's not going to be called NAFTA, but a new agreement trade deal with Mexico. Trump made the announcement at the White House today. Here's what he said. Jeff Sessions recused himself. Oops, sorry. Which he shouldn't have done. Or he should have told me. That might have been my fault. Go ahead and play the other Trump cut. That was my fault. Sorry, I I gave poor Rob like a bajillion sound cuts today. And I told him to play the wrong one. So go ahead and play the right one. I like to call this deal the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement. I think it's an elegant name. I think NAFTA has a lot of bad connotations for the United States because it was a ripoff. It was a deal that was a horrible deal for our country. All right. So he's never liked NAFTA. Now, I've never understood what the big problem with NAFTA is. I mean, when you actually look at the stats, it has not hurt this country. It has hurt certain areas. I understand you're going to have winners and losers in any kind of trade agreement like that. But overall, I think the country has pretty much benefited from the NAFTA deal. This idea that NAFTA was the worst thing ever. I never made any sense to me. Whatever. I know a lot of Trump supporters disagree with me on that. And I know uh, Trump disagrees with me on that. That's fine. But there was one little part of this this new agreement they have with Mexico now. It was a part of this new NAFTA agreement or whatever he called it. And by the way, this is not set in stone. First, they want to try to get Canada on board, and then they want to, it has to pass Congress. So we'll see what happens. This isn't a done deal yet, just so everyone knows that. But here's the big part of it that got a lot of attention today. It said, under the changes agreed to by Mexico and the United States, car companies would be required to manufacture at least 75% of any automobile's value in North America under the new rules up from 62.5% to qualify for NAFTA's zero tariffs. Okay, that's fine. No problem with that. They will also be required to use more local steel, aluminum, and auto parts and have 40 to 45% of the car made by workers earning at least $16 an hour. Now, the reason why they put that in is because a lot of the labor unions, big labor unions, wanted that. Because they're those some of NAFTA's biggest credits have been these labor unions. So at least forty to forty five percent of the car made by workers earning at least sixteen dollars an hour. You know what that is, don't you? When you think about it, no one's uh, no one else has brought this up, but you know what that is? That's basically raising the minimum wage on auto workers. That's what he's done here. Raise the minimum wage on auto workers. Now, what they will say, the reason why a lot of these car companies go to build their plants in Mexico is because they have cheaper wages in Mexico. And the labor unions obviously don't like that because they want to have higher wages and all these benefits, which was actually hurting the car companies even before it was going to Mexico. But I always thought conservatives were against raising the minimum wage. I thought raising the minimum wage usually just raised prices. And raised inflation and caused worker, you know, to cut workers' jobs. But basically, we have a trade deal that does just that. It's kind of a backhanded way of doing it. But that's what what happened here. 
They have 40 to 45 percent of the car made by workers earning at least $16 an hour. That's a backhanded way of raising the minimum wage. Conserv- and a lot of Trump supporters are missing that, and they don't have a problem with it. But I think it is a problem. I don't think it's the government's job to dictate this. And by the way, it's a required to use more local steel, aluminum, and auto parts. Um, that's protectionism. But that's, I mean, that's what Trump has been for. So we'll see what happens. It's not a set deal, but I just thought that little part was kind of interesting because they basically had a back, backhanded way of raising the minimum wage. And then a lot of conservatives are going to say it's great, but I'm like, oh, I thought we were against raising the minimum wage. I guess we don't care anymore. Okay. Well, all right. Whatever. Okay, so I wanted to end the show um, with basically what I started the show with, which was this verse, these verses in Colossians, Colossians chapter three, because I think this is something that our culture really needs and doesn't have in terms of politics and everything else. I've mentioned it a couple times in the show already, and I figured, man, that's a good way to end the show. Um, Colossians chapter three, it's uh, written by Paul, who is running the church at Colossae. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because I went to a church service, small church Bible study last night, and he had mentioned this, and it just kind of hit me that, wow, this is this is the verse that our times, our culture needs to hear over and over again. It really is. So chapter 3, verse 5, starting with verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And all and over all these virtues, put on the love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And when you read that, you have to say, and this includes a lot of people who say they're Christians, they, we are not living like this in American culture. All you have to do is go on social media, see it every day, especially in our politics. We are not living like this. And I wish we could just put this up. I don't know, put it up in Washington, D.C., <laughs> put it up wherever. Because, I mean, I mean, look what it says. Take away anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. That's all over our culture today, especially on social media. Instead, we're called to be the new self. That's what being a Christian is about, taking away the old self, putting on the new self. We're called to be... You know, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I don't see any of those things in our culture today. Tweet it out there. Put it on Twitter. They'll actually look, uh, might read it. Well, good point. Yeah, you got to get it out there. Of course, there's people that will say, oh, you're getting too preachy. Oh, get off your high horse. You need that. We, I think we've established that we need more of that. We need I more agree. high horse. <laughs> I like that. We need- You do. Of course, out of context, that might sound bad. We need more high horse. We were like, "What?" But you're right. Uh, don't let your don't let your values go to the wayside because of your political ideologies. Well, yeah, and it's and this is really beyond politics. It's just our culture in general. We don't strive for these things anymore. We used to strive to be better. The bar I is under, low. Yeah, I understand that we're not going to be perfect. I understand we're not going to reach these things. I understand I am definitely not perfect in reaching for these things. But at least we, shouldn't we still try, you know? Shouldn't we still... There should be a standard at least we can reach to. Yeah. It doesn't sound too complicated, but when you look in today, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. 
When I've mentioned stuff like this about problems in our culture today on today's show, I mentioned the problems I have with Trump and some of his character flaws. People don't want to hear it from me, which means I need to say it more. Definitely. Great show, Mike. <laughs> I appreciate and it. And don't Rob. forget to vote tomorrow, Central Floridians. Oh, yeah, definitely. Voting for tomorrow. And we'll recap it tomorrow on Good Morning Orlando and later in the week as well. I appreciate you joining me. This is Beyond Reason Radio. Catch the podcast if you missed any of the show, and we'll be, you know, catch you guys next time.